Hello, my friends. Welcome to my home. I apologize for any echoing you may hear, but I had to come home to record this because I had some business to take care of here. Anyway, last week we looked at the title, Son of God, and we identified it as a messianic reference, speaking of the divine nature of the Lord Jesus. It spoke of his redemptive work done on our behalf, and it also speaks of his future plans for his coming kingdom. Today we want to look at the title Son of Man, which is also a Messianic title. It's a term that's found frequently in the Old Testament, but it's most often used to speak of men and their humanity. For example, Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. And then there's the prophet Ezekiel. He is called the son of man by God in his prophecy more than 90 times. And so it's a clear reference to our humanness. It's interesting that this title, however, is found only twice in the Old Testament with reference to the Lord Jesus. The first one I want to show you is in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. The prophet Daniel is prophesying about four successive world kingdoms. And they're symbolically represented by animals. The kingdom of Babylon was represented as a lion. The Medo-Persian empire was portrayed as a bear. And then the Greek empire was pictured as a leopard. And they were followed by a fourth beast. And Daniel says it was dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. And it was a representation of the Roman empire. But Daniel's point in telling us about these four kingdoms is that they're going to come and they're going to go. They will come to an end. But there is a fifth kingdom that is coming, an eternal kingdom. And he speaks about this in verses 13 and 14. And he says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So here's a a reference to the messianic kingdom telling us that this coming king is a man. Daniel also tells us later on in that same passage that we, his saints, are going to be reigning with him. But the interesting thing about this passage is that the kingdom of God is going to be ruled by a man. And the Messiah is both God and man. Psalm 8 verses 4 through 6 points out that man was made a little bit lower than the angels. But when we read in Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 6 through 8, this is, the writer of Hebrews applies this, this passage in Psalms, to the Lord Jesus. And it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and have put all things under his feet. The writer of Hebrews quotes this psalm, and then he adds in verse 9, chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And so these are the only two connections to the Lord Jesus of this term, Son of Man, that we find in the Old Testament. Now you notice as we read through the Gospels that this is a title that it actually seems to be his favorite title to use of himself because he used it no less than 80 times. No one else ever called him by that name, but when we get to the book of Acts, we find Stephen, as he's preaching, he's being stoned for his preaching the gospel. And as he's dying, he says, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, we know the scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of his Father, but here we seem to see the Lord Jesus standing up to welcome Stephen to glory. And then the Apostle John, he also refers to him twice in his book of Revelation, referring to him as one like the Son of Man. Now, ironically, 
in Numbers 23 and verse 19, this term was used to explain that God is nothing like us. While at the same time, Jesus used it as a term to identify himself as being like us. But he is not just a son of man like us. That's a general term pointing to our humanness. But he is the son of man, which specifically identifies him as the God-man. And it's important for us to understand that he is not half God and half man. Jesus Christ is all God and he is all man. He is as much God as his father and he is as much human as you and me. That makes him unique. And as such, he is the only person who can reconcile a sinful humanity to a holy God. First Timothy chapter two and verse five says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's absolutely no one else who is qualified or is able to make peace between sinful men and a holy God. That's why Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one else can be the go-between between a holy God and you and I who are sinful human beings. Only Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. This theological term for his unique characteristic is called the hypostatic union. It speaks of the personal union of his divine nature and his human nature. So one nature is fully human and one is fully divine. So as the son of man, we need to note that there are several implications. Number one is the son of man, he is as much human as you and I. It's a mystery when you consider how his humanity played out in real life. Paul even admits in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Ladies and gentlemen, we can rejoice because we have a man in glory who represents us. It's interesting that many scholars believe those words in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 are the words to a hymn. We can also be grateful that it is his humanity that enables him to be able to empathize with us. You see, he has experienced all the limits of our humanity. He got hungry and thirsty, and that tells us how he must have felt when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan and still did not sin. Just imagine what it must have been like for him to fast for 40 days and yet still be able to resist temptation. I remember years ago, I met a man, Michael Bentley. He was in the 38th day of a 40-day fast. He had lost 60 pounds. And he was so weak, he could barely stand up. But I tell you, it really gave me a whole new appreciation for the Lord Jesus and what he went through as he fasted in the wilderness and still was able to resist temptation. He also got tired like you and I. He went to sleep in the boat with his disciples, if you recall. He knew the heartache of betrayal. He knew the excruciating pain of torture and crucifixion and death. As the writer of Hebrews reminds us, he tasted death for every man. This Greek word for taste means that he fully experienced death. John Murray comments and he says, quote, he humbled himself to the accursed death of the cross. There were no lower depths possible for the cross bespeaks the whole curse of God upon sin. It is humiliation, inimitable, unrepeated, unrepeatable. Now, because Jesus is the son of man, he can identify with us more than we know. You know, sometimes we go through things, we struggle, we fail, we feel like nobody understands, nobody understands what we're going through, they don't know what we're feeling. But dear one, Jesus knows completely. He knows fully. That's why Peter would tell us, 
that we should cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. First Peter 5, 7. And of course, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And it's so interesting, this fact that our Lord Jesus Christ remained without sin. This is what brings us to our next point. As the Son of Man, he is our sinless substitute. As the perfect man who never sinned, he was able to redeem sinful men. If he had sinned himself, he couldn't redeem me because he would have to take care of his own sin problem. But that's why he needed to be tempted. His pure character, his sinless nature had to be proven. The fact that Jesus Christ could not be our substitute if he did not become a man was also had to be because he was sinless. Now, on several occasions, he would tell his disciples that he was going to die for them. He said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 31, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. He spoke of his death as the Son of Man several times. The key verse in Luke's gospel is Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, where he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But he had to die to make that possible. And the Bible is clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22 Jesus is the Son of God who became the Son of Man so that he could shed his innocent blood for us. And had he not done that, my friends, there would be no way for him to redeem us. You see, all these animals that had been sacrificed in the Old Testament, they couldn't take away sin. Their blood only covered sin until that one final sacrifice would come to, to take away the sins of the world for good. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 12 says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The Son of Man bore the full weight of our sin, and he shed our precious, his precious blood. We've been forgiven, we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Peter describes it, his blood, as of a lamb without blemish. And without spot. So as our sinless substitute, he not only died for us, <laughs> he died instead of us. He died in our place. You see, it should have been us who died for our own sin. But the blood of his sinless human body was required in order for us to be forgiven. And he willingly gave himself for us and instead of us. And thirdly, as a son of man, he will return in glory. Jesus often used this term to speak of his return. In Matthew chapter 24 and 27, he said, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the son of man be. Then he spoke of the tribulation and he said, Then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory, verse 30 of Matthew 24. Then he also used it to speak of coming judgment. In Matthew chapter 13 and verses 41 and 42, he said that the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. My friends, the judgment that we find in the scriptures is, is real. And I wish it was something that we didn't have to talk about. But the only reason we have to proclaim the gospel is because judgment is bad news and the gospel is the good news. Now, Elmer Towns noted that Jesus spoke of himself as the son of man in three contexts. First of all, the context of his earthly ministry. He used it to confirm that even as a man, he still had divine authority to, to heal a paralytic. Because he said, 
but you that but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Secondly, he used it in the context of his approaching death on the cross. He said in Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then thirdly, he used it in an eschatological context with reference to his second coming. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 36, he warns us, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. And in Mark chapter 14 and verse 62, he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then let's not forget that Daniel also prophesied, reminding us that, that we have a man, that we'll have a man in the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ will be reigning the eternal kingdom and you and I are gonna be privileged and blessed to be able to rule with him. What a, what a thrill that's gonna be. I, can't, I just can't imagine that. But let me close now with the words of Clarence Hayes Jr. He, he wrote this about this title, Son of Man, and I really liked it. I thought it was appropriate to close with. He says, the fact is he took his divinity wrapped it in humanity, and became the Son of Man. To sum it up best, he became like us so that we could become like him. I have discovered that the more you know about Jesus, the more you will fall in love with him. And this title of the Son of Man is truly no different. You've heard me say this before, the more you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you're going to talk about him, the more you'll tell about him. So I pray that this whole title, the Son of Man, coupled with the Son of God, these two titles, as Messianic titles that go together, speak of his perfect divinity and his perfect humanity, blending together the unique God-man being our representative in glory. Pray with me. Loving Father, we are amazed that you would send your only son to become the son of man, that he might represent us, that he might die for us. Thank you that because he's a man, he understands us perfectly, he loves us greatly, and he cares about us deeply. May the Son of Man open blind eyes to see that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. May they understand that he offered himself as our sinless substitute to ransom their soul. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. Amen. Well, my friends, thank you again for joining me. I hope this title for the Lord Jesus has encouraged you, the Son of Man. Let me know your thoughts. If you have any questions, I'd love to help you to know more about Jesus. It would be an honor for me to be able to share with you what God has shown me. Nothing I love more than talking about the Lord Jesus. So if I can help you in any way, please let me know. Lord willing, I'll be here next week. God bless you. See you next time.